Okay, hello. I would like to welcome you all to our library science talk on SciHub and its consequences. Today's guest is Daniel Himmelstein from the University of Pennsylvania. And we are very pleased that Raphael Ball from the ETH Bibliothek has joined us uh, as a dialogue partner. I already know that uh, Daniel will show us a very compelling scenario of SciHub's implications for scientific communication. Daniel is a data scientist and he will use statistics as a main argument. But since I'm just a humanities guy, I would like to start uh, with a historic perspective on our subject. It reaches back to the year 1500 when Erasmus of Rotterdam, who later lived in nearby Basel, published his Adagia. The Adagia are a collection of ancient proverbs and as his first example, Erasmus chose amicorum communia omnia, which means friends share everything. I would, I would suggest that this proverb is an interesting starting point for our library science talk because Erasmus' idea of friendship is different from ours. For him, friendship was the tie that united the members of the Republic of Letters. This elite circle of scholars exchanged ideas among its peers. They chose friendship as a mode that fostered communication without social borders. This model of humanistic friendship has been adopted by scientists who interact within academic circles throughout the world since the time of Isaac Newton. Even today, Erasmus' mode of friendly, polite, and respectful interaction among colleagues is what we all learn while we study at a university. We help each other, we freely exchange ideas, we are generous in handing over copies of our publications without asking for money. For several centuries, it was usual to present off-prints of research papers to esteemed fellow scientists. Even today, academic social networks are built on the tradition of making research um, efforts freely available to other scientists. The process of transforming research into a marketable product, such as a book or an article for a journal, on the other hand, is not part of a scientist's business. I have the impression that this is one of the reasons why many researchers are indifferent to the needs and wishes of their publishers. But let us start with uh, today's program. It is an honor to have uh, Raphael Ball here at the Zentralbibliothek. Raphael Ball has been Dean of the Library of the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology since 2015. Before that, he worked for well over 10 years at the Library of the Research Center in Jülich, which he headed since 1998. Following Jülich in 2008, he became director of the University Library in Regensburg. Before his career in the library world, he worked as a scientist in the fields of biology and science history. He has written numerous publications, among them two books on bibliometrics, and he's actively involved in research fields such, uh, that are devoted to the future development of libraries, as well as the digital transformation of science communication. He's a member of several international associations and acts as chief editor of BIT Online. Our guest speaker, Daniel Himmelstein, is a data scientist who devotes his efforts to medical questions, mostly uh, relating to cancer research and genome biology. From 2007 to 2011, Daniel studied biostatistics at Cornell U University before he joined the University of California, San Francisco, as a graduate student. At uh, UCSF, he received his PhD in biological and medical informatics in 2016. <coughs> Since then, he is postdoctoral fellow at the University of Pennsylvania, where he is member of Casey Green's Integrative Genomics Lab. Daniel has already written an impressive number of research papers on topics ranging from the field of bioinformatics, and together with a number of other scientists, among them Casey Green, he has already published an elaborate article uh, for eLife. Its title, SciHub provides access to nearly all scholarly literature, 
explains immediately why he was invited to join us in Geneva yesterday and in Zurich today. I'm very certain that you will all agree with me within the next hour, namely that it is indeed a great pleasure to welcome you here at the Central Bibliothek. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Very nice introduction, and I like the historical perspective. <laughs> so as, as you mentioned, I'm a data scientist. Uh, I mostly focus not really on bibliometrics or other uh, issues of publishing, but I'll explain today how I got into this topic and why I think it's so fascinating and timely. And I couldn't think of a better group of people to present it to than who we have assembled today. So let's get into it. What is Sci-Hub? It's a website uh, which is currently available at sci-hub.new and sci-hub.tw. Now you may immediately recognize that these are sort of obscure um, extensions. So what is the .nu extension? That stands for the island state of new and then tw is for Taiwan. And actually these have changed a lot because they get taken down, which is something that we'll get into later on. Um, there are ways that you can find the current domains by going to the Wikipedia page or by trying this new website, sci-hub.app. But here's a list of some of the past domains, uh, which is growing, and I don't think this is exhaustive, but <laughs> you get the idea. The website would look like this if you go to it. And all it really is for is for entering the ID of a scholarly article and for getting the PDF back. Uh, so it's a way to get the full text of an article. Uh, in this case, I'll put in a DOI, which stands for Digital Object Identifier, which is just the type of ID that scholarly articles often get assigned. Uh, here I've specified a paper in Nature, and were I to press Enter, you would get the article back like this. Now, in this case, this is an open access article. Nature is primarily a subscription publisher that does not publish open access, meaning that copyright laws can prevent the sharing of it. Uh, however, this is an exception, I think, due to the uh, content matter where they put this under an open license. So using Sci-Hub to retrieve this article is, uh, does not violate any laws because it's um, the license allows for sharing the article. But Sci-Hub is used and, as you'll see, does aim specifically to capture articles that don't have open licenses, where publishers want to sell access rather than uh, for them to be freely avail available and shareable. I'll give you a little history now of this resource and uh, it's been gathered by digging through sort of old forums and uh, news articles uh, about it. But in 2011, September, someone named Alexandra Elbakian created Sci-Hub. Uh, she's from Kazakhstan. She was a graduate student at the time, and uh, she was frustrated by access to literature, and now she uh, is thought to reside in Russia. And for this initial period, uh, from 2011 to most of the way through 2012, whenever someone used Sci-Hub to request an article, it would uh, proxy a university and download that article. It had no caching, meaning if I requested the same article that someone else had done the day before, it would download it twice. So it wasn't an efficient implementation. But that didn't matter because it wasn't used very much. <laughs> As you see on the y-axis, this is search interest for the term Sci-Hub in red on Google. And there were very few searches back at that time. Very few people knew about the service, and it really wasn't marketed at that time um, you know, to I, most people in the Western world. Uh, there's also another site, or shadow library it's called, that is Libgen. Uh, and LibGen on this plot will be in gray. Uh, LibGen also provides access to full texts. Uh, they include books, which Sci-Hub does not, uh, but they're more opaque, opaque in their operations, and the administrators don't speak publicly or reveal their identities, whereas Alexandra Elbakian has been very forward with um, 
discussing her role in Sci-Hub, Sci-Hub's vision, and trying to advertise it and get it out there. Ah, I wanted to go to the next slide, but we've hit a paywall. <laughs> so I'm gonna need, let's see, $10 to, to continue. Um, no, this is the first paywall recorded on the internet. Michael Eisen found it. It's from 1997 uh, in Science Magazine. And it provides some historical perspective because um, before you know, the internet was here, articles were, were published in journals that were printed and that had a cost. Uh, but no one really knew how this system would transition to the internet. Uh, but publishers found very early on that they were going to charge for the articles. And that became the primary way that people started accessing scholarly content uh, from these journals. But we will override this paywall. <laughs> so in this uh, 2013, Sci-Hub switched to using LibGen, uh, the other database I mentioned, to cache its articles. So when you requested an article from Sci-Hub, it would first see if it was in LibGen. If so, it would uh, give you that copy. If it was not in LibGen, it would download the copy and then place it in LibGen. And so that persisted up until 2015 when LibGen had an outage, which we will get to on this next slide. Uh, so in this outage, what had happened is Allegedly, one of the site administrators of LibGen had passed away from cancer, and the uh, registration of the domain had expired. So LibGen stopped working. You can see a lot of people start Googling it, because they're probably like, why does this thing not work that worked yesterday? Uh, we see that a lot in the search uh, history. It also caused Sci-Hub to create its own repository, where they would still deposit articles they downloaded to LibGen, but now they started storing the articles themselves. Uh, fast forward, and we see the first real spike in interest in Sci-Hub. Until now, the growth had been gradual, and the interest was relatively low. Uh, but Elsevier, the largest scholarly publisher, noticed Sci-Hub and filed suit against them in the United States District for Southern New York. Now, does anyone have an, an idea what this photo is? <laughs> this is, uh, well, it was image 3850 uh, for someone's project who was profiling the California coastline, um, trying to look for coastal erosion. Uh, but then the person who owns his house, Barbara Streisand, found it and was quite upset that a picture of her house was online and filed a lawsuit uh, asking to take it down and maybe there are some damages, which is a frivolous lawsuit because there's nothing wrong under US law for taking this picture and posting it. And it had less than 10 views when she filed the lawsuit and it almost overnight had hundreds of thousands of views. Uh, so this is called the Streisand effect. And we see it play out beautifully when Elsevier sues Sci-Hub. Uh, <laughs> As people say, what is this thing Elsevier is suing? Hmm, maybe it works. <laughs> Otherwise, they wouldn't sue it. Uh, so later on, Elsevier is granted a preliminary injunction to suspend the domain names. So sci-hub.org goes away. So that first domain is now censored and it's gone. And you will see here this major spike in searches as people hear about the suspension and also probably start Googling, you know, how do I use Sci-Hub? It doesn't work. And Sci-Hub is actually down, I believe, for 10 days uh, after this, before it popped up at new domains. Uh, then later on, uh, a journalist, Simon Oxenham, published Meet the Robin Hood of Science. And this got a lot of people interested because it was a compelling story about the motives um, of the creator and uh, potentially how Sci-Hub fits into the larger picture of academic publishing. Uh, so this led to a lot more media coverage, such as the New York Times asking, should all research papers be free? Later on, a journalist named John Bohannon published a news piece in Science Magazine, uh, which, for which he had collaborated uh, with Alexandra to get the download logs from Sci-Hub. So over this period in the light blue here, uh, they collected all the downloaded papers 
and they also had the IP addresses of who downloaded those papers so they could see where in the world Sci-Hub was being used to access literature and for which publishers uh, the downloads were occurring. And they really found, as you can see from this visualization, um, access was occurring globally. It was occurring uh, in countries with very poor access to the literature, like such as Iran, uh, but also in countries with good access to the literature, such as the US, Europe. Um, in fact, many of the requests seemed to be coming from universities that probably had access to the content through authorized channels, which brings up a recurring and interesting um, point that sometimes the access provided through the authorized channels is so inconvenient that Sci-Hub is much faster and easier to use. And this especially would be true if someone were, say, access, accessing a paper on their phone where um, it's difficult to use some other methods. And this started a, a very large conversation about Sci-Hub. Fast forward, uh, now uh, through 2016, and Elsevier wins the default judgment. Default means that uh, Sci-Hub never contested this in the US court. Uh, Ac Alexandra did write a letter to the court, but it wasn't a formal um, defense of herself. Uh, she essentially decided that she was not going to engage with the US legal system and just let the charges go however they go. <laughs> and uh, Elsevier was awarded $15 million, which in their complaint they had listed 100 works. Under the US statutes, the law, the punishment for one instance of copyright violation can be, is a maximum of $150,000. So 100 works times $150,000 equals $15 million. I actually went through the 100 works which were in the um, suit and I found this interesting one which was called Representative Work Number 28, uh, which was published in 2013 in the journal Ocean Engineering. And what I found interesting at the bottom is that it said Crown Copyright. And I didn't know what that was, but I looked into it. Uh, this is from the UK and I believe it had some funding from the UK government and it says Crown Copyright because under UK law, uh, this work, or the work funded by this grant should be in the public domain. So I believe Elsevier probably didn't have good records of which of these articles you know, were in the public domain and which of them that they owned the rights for. So even the publisher has trouble saying which intellectual property is whose. Um, if any of you have engaged in publishing with journals, I think you know it oftentimes is quite a mess. Uh, but I think this is a good example. Uh, then later, uh, the American Chemical Society, which is a nonprofit publisher, uh, Elsevier is a for profit publisher, uh, they filed suit against SciHub in the Eastern District of Virginia. And actually, they had to advertise this in the Washington Times, which we'll, we'll get to in a little bit. Um, now here's an interesting thing that happened in September of 2017. SciHub uh, voluntarily blocked access to Russian IP addresses uh, due to what's believed to be disputes with the scientific establishment. It's sort of difficult to know why. Alexandra did make a post about it, but it was a little bit uh, unclear. But one thing she mentioned was that this new species that had been discovered uh, was named after her and it was called Ideogramma albachiane, uh, which I would have been happy if a species were named after me, but since it was a parasitoid wasp, I think she thought they were calling her a parasite and she didn't like it. <laughs> but um, access was restored to Russia shortly after. It's an interesting example because Sci-Hub obviously has dealt with a lot of external pressures to cease service and it's been able to weather them okay by getting new domains. Um, but it is very centralized and that's something we should be aware of in that uh, because it's centralized, it could be shut off immediately. Uh, the run, the, it, they, it could become paywalled, <laughs> you know. Um, it could be tracking you when you use it. All of these are considerations. Luckily, since a lot of the articles are in LibGen and people can torrent that, there is an, some amount of redundancy. Uh, but right now, SciHub is a centralized service. 
Uh, so later on in 2017, the American Chemical Society wins its suit. And this is the uh, word wording from the judgment. So the court ordered that any person or entity in active concert participation with SciHub, including any internet search engines, web hosting and internet service providers, domain name registrars and domain name registries, cease facilitating access to any or all domain names and websites. It continues. But what's bold about this, especially for uh, US rulings, is that it seems to have an effect on more parties than just SciHub. In fact, most of the parties it has an effect on um, have traditionally been considered neutral service providers. So should your internet company have to block uh, you, know, you accessing SciHub? And this is still likely going to play out in the US courts. But um, ACS did secure this ruling, which is much more broad than many past rulings in the US. Uh, so now when ACS goes to people and tries to get them to comply with it, if they refuse, that could set precedent. I think it's a little bit interesting and ironic, perhaps, that the ACS mission is to advance the broader chemistry enterprise and its practitioners for the benefit of Earth and its people. So it's really a society that's devoted, or says they're devoted to doing good, but yet they are now setting precedent for a less free internet uh, th through this proceeding. In December 7, 2017, um, s these domains got, get suspended due to the ACS uh, judgment, and there's a huge spike in interest. So if we compare the last time that there was a service outage, which is D to L, you can see just in the last two and a half years, there's been maybe a quadrupling by this metric in the interest and usage of SciHub. So now that we've gone over the history, uh, this is where my involvement really began. Um, SciHub in March 2017 tweeted, if you like the list of all DOI collected on SciHub, here it is. 62 million DOI in alphabetical order. I was like, this is really cool. I can use my data abilities to look at what articles they have and then um, you know, explore what's in their database. One point I want to make is that these are the articles that SciHub already has in its database. However, if SciHub doesn't have an article, it attempts to download it in real time. Uh, so potentially SciHub can access more articles, but these are articles that it's already accessed. Uh, another thing is, while in the past it seems like SciHub mostly downloaded articles based on request, there's mounting evidence that now they've directly infiltrated some publishers and they're downloading the articles in, in bulk. Sometimes, allegedly, before they've even been published, an article will appear on SciHub. So we did this project openly from the beginning using a website called GitHub, which is a place where you can put like a code repository. Uh, so we started making these commits, which are just essentially changes to the analysis. So, so the whole history of this project is available and it was public from its start. And what was cool about that is um, we could invite people or people could find it since there you know, weren't many expert scholars at University of Pennsylvania on SciHub. In fact, there are very few in the world. We could connect with a lot of them online. Uh, so these are all the repositories we had for this project for different aspects of the project. And we used this model where we would have issues to discuss uh, the project, and so we got a lot of involvement from different people, and that was really exciting, and I think a good model for how science can become more real-time, and potentially we may not even need journals <laughs> eventually, because uh, I think you know we were able to do this study entirely with peer review from the beginning and a lot of engagement. So the question we really wanted to answer was, what scholarly articles are not in SciHub? In the past, some people have taken a look at you know, what is in it, but it's actually more interesting what is not in it because that's stuff that SciHub doesn't have access to, and that allows you to know the overall coverage or percent of a certain category that SciHub possesses. So to do this, um, we use the digital object identifier system, 
which are essentially IDs which are given to papers. There are 10 DOI registration agencies. Uh, you may have heard of some like DataCite, Crossref. Uh, there's actually even one that does uh, identifiers for pornography. So it's a very versatile system. But the one we used was not that one, it was Crossref, which really focuses on scholarly publications. And they have registered 67% of all the DOIs in existence. And we think almost all of the scientific articles that use DOIs uh, do it through Crossref. So in 2015, researchers found that 99.9% .9 of English Wikipedia DOI links went to articles that were registered with Crossref. And not all articles have DOIs. We were looking at some rare books <laughs> earlier. They certainly don't have DOIs, <laughs> but um, the DOIs have to be assigned by the publisher. 90% uh, of newly published articles in the sciences do. So we extracted from Crossref a catalog of 87 million DOIs. And we assume that this is essentially the entire corpus of scholarly literature. Obviously, it misses some things, but uh, this was the best way that we could get a really exhaustive catalog. And a public service annou announcement, DOIs are case insensitive. Uh, so if you're trying to merge data sets, uh, make sure that you uh, say, put all the DOIs to lowercase, or otherwise they won't, won't merge properly. Uh, so we posted a preprint on the topic. Uh, this is actually what got the most attention. A preprint is uh, when you make the paper or your study and you post it online but without peer review or journal. Um, so it's a way of speeding up the publishing process because people can immediately see your results and they don't have to wait uh, for the journal to accept it and then publish it. Uh, we actually posted three versions of the preprint before it was published in eLife, the peer review journal. Um, with some additional analyses that we had added throughout. And there are some links here uh, if you're interested, such as the eLife podcast and the Reddit Ask Me Anything we did on the topic. So now let's go to what we found. Uh, so if we look at SciHub's coverage of two categories of journals, uh, the first one will be toll access journals, toll meaning like paywall, so journals where uh, they don't publish all their articles in open ways and that uh, you would have to potentially subscribe to to get access. Uh, there were 55 million of those articles and SciHub had access to 46 million of them, or not, SciHub had in its database 46 million. That's 85%. Uh, so it has quite high coverage of these articles in toll access journals. If instead we look at open access journals where there were much fewer articles since open access is a newer um, mode of publishing, uh, there were three million articles, SciHub had 48% of those. So we start to see here that SciHub's focus is subscription publishing, is toll access articles and not open access articles. Now, in a way, getting access to open access articles is much more trivial. You don't need to do any hacking, you don't need to infiltrate any universities or publishers, you can just request the paper. And if the publisher's website's up, you'll get it. Uh, it's really these toll access articles that are much harder to obtain, and it seems to be SciHub's focus, and SciHub has done a remarkable job um, being able to essentially perform this unauthorized download of articles at such a massive scale. Uh, so we can look over time and the open access plot is a little bit more choppy, especially since there are fewer open access journals. Uh, but the coverage of SciHub's, SciHub's coverage in toll access journals is pretty consistent around in between 80 and 90 percent until a very recent years. So uh, 2016, 2000 and um, well, I think that could be 2017 and 16. The insight here is that when an article is published, it's often not immediately uploaded to SciHub. It takes some time for the article to be published and maybe a user, a SciHub user to request it and then get downloaded into SciHub's database. We looked at the different types of articles. Uh, the two main articles, which are um, 
most of what was in CrossRef were journal articles and conference proceedings, uh, of which Sci-Hub had above 75% coverage. Sci-Hub had much lower coverage on the 10 million book chapters, uh, which are also a, a common form of scholarly document. And in a blog post in 2017, um, Alexandra kind of confirmed this finding we had, as she, and she wrote, currently the Sci-Hub does not store books. For books, users are redirected to LibGen, but not for research papers. In future, I also want to expand the Sci-Hub repository and add books too. Now we can look at the subject areas which are included in Sci-Hub. At the bottom was computer science, where Sci-Hub only contains 76% of the articles. And up top was chemistry and chemical engineering, uh, which Sci-Hub had 93% of. Uh, this is interesting because people have observed that Sci-Hub is very heavily used to download chemistry articles. Um, so while there is variation by discipline, Sci-Hub does work relatively well, it appears, for most disciplines. So it's definitely not restricted to any single discipline. And by publisher. By publisher, there's actually a lot of variation. So at the top, you have American Physical Society, which is almost 100% covered. Um, these are only showing large publishers, so that had, uh, I believe, published over a certain number of articles. American Chemical Society, which had filed the suit, is 98.8% in Sci-Hub. Uh, IEEE is near 99%. Uh, a little bit down, we have Elsevier, who sued Sci-Hub at 97.3%. And down here at the bottom, we have Public Library of Science, which is an open access publisher. So I think this makes the point <laughs> clearly now, if you have some problem against being in Sci-Hub, one good way to do it is one way to avoid that is to become open access. <laughs> but um, we put these findings online in a browsable format. So we have what's called the publisher coverage table, where you can look at each publisher. So this is sorted by uh, the total number of articles they've published. So Elsevier has published 13 million articles. And you know essentially, most of those are um, in Sci-Hub. And it's split between. Uh, open access journals and, um, uh, sorry, that's the percent of Elsevier's articles which are in open access journals, which is only 1.6%. And you can see that varies by publisher. If you click on a publisher, we, let's do Spring of Nature, uh, you can get the plots for each year. Uh, so you can see how Sci-Hub's coverage of the toll access uh, Spring or Nature articles is going down in recent years, but for years before 1970, it's almost entirely complete. Uh, here's an interesting plot based on Sci-Hub's download logs, where you see that over 55% of the articles in, uh, by Nature Springer were never downloaded once using Sci-Hub. Uh, it's interesting to see this distribution, and I'm sure the librarians are well aware of it, that most resources are not used once, <laughs> and a very few resources are used a lot. Something to keep in mind. We have the, a similar browsable interface online for journals. So for example, we could go to the New England Journal of Medicine, and he, uh, this is a journal for which Sci-Hub has essentially every article. Um, and it's, it's a really highly read um, journal, so you can see only 30% of the articles were never downloaded. And actually you can scroll down and see which articles uh, were downloaded the most. So this is a fun resource to play with potentially. It's even a way you could get altmetrics for some of these journals as a librarian deciding you know, <laughs> how the usage for these journals. So we looked at uh, for each journal and each publisher, what percent of it was in Sci-Hub's database? And you can see this distribution which uh, a journal or publisher is either probably very well covered or very poorly covered in Sci-Hub. The articles are almost all in Sci-Hub or almost entirely absent, which kind of makes sense. Once Sci-Hub has 
found the formula to be able to download from a certain journal, it can pretty exhaustively download it. But there may be some obscure journals um, or journals that have different types of access that it hasn't um, cracked. We also saw we group the journals based on the citations they receive. So citations are a commonly used measure of prestige for journals. So average citations to articles in the journal uh, using a measure called site score. So we uh, divided the journal into 10 deciles or 10 groups. And you can see that for the least cited journals, SciHub's coverage is much lower at about 40%. Uh, but as you get to the most cited journals, it gets higher. So SciHub definitely is preferentially covering popular content. We actually see that in an even more extreme way when we looked at SciHub's coverage of cited articles. Because uh, previously we've just been talking about uh, how SciHub covered, covered every article of a certain category. But as we said, users don't equally use every article of a, of, you know, a certain discipline uh, or category. So we extracted citations from a resource called Open Citations. Nowadays, I would suggest using Initiative for Open Citations data, which provides many more citations. It's a really cool project that just got off the ground with large data in the last year. But um, at this time, we used Open Citations. So we looked for recent studies, studies since 2015, and we took all the citations in their bibliography. So they had 6.2 million citations outgoing to articles in Toll Access journals. And SciHub in its database contained 96% of those articles. So essentially, if you were to go take an article from um, after 2015, flip to the bibliography, SciHub would have you know, 19 out of 20 of those papers if they, if they were to Toll Access articles. Obviously, if it's to an open access article, you don't need to sign up. <laughs> and let's say the publisher's website was down, which does happen. Uh, we also looked at SciHub's coverage by category of article access. So here we used a utility called OADOI, which uh, looks for a certain article, and it categorizes it into one of five access categories. So starting here with gold, gold refers to journals where all the articles are published openly. Uh, these would be like the PLOS journals uh, or in the humanities. There are some new publishers, I think, Open, Humlib or something like that, um, that really only publish journals that, where every article is open access. Hybrid refers to a toll access journal where specific articles have been published under open licenses. This is a growing model because a lot of authors want to publish open access. Some funders require it. Uh, so in this case, usually there's a quite high fee uh, to publish that specific article in the subscription journal, but doing it under an open license. And that's great for that one article. Um, it's not great for libraries, potentially, because they still have to subscribe to that journal. And thus far, libraries have had some trouble you know, knowing what percent of the articles are hybrid, and they may actually be paying twice, essentially, for... Uh, some content. Green open access refers to when the article is not free from its publisher, so it's toll access from its publisher, but it's available from a third party resource, uh, presumably like a non illicit resource. So this would exclude SciHub. Um, SciHub is usually called black open access if it were given a color. But um, <laughs> here it would be. Uh, things in like preprint servers or institutional repositories, the assumption being that uh, these don't violate the copyright agreement with publishers, although sometimes they do, but they're usually hosted by organizations that um, are interested in maintaining legally compliant. Uh, and there are bronze open access articles, which are um, freely available from a subscription journal but don't have an open license and essentially were not thought to be hybrid. And uh, this was a surprise that there were so many of these articles for the OADOI uh, researchers, but they're essentially articles where the journal makes the article free to read, although at any time they could flip a switch and start charging people for it. 
So it means it's essentially temporarily uh, free to read. And journals may want to do this because um, they like getting citations because that increases their prestige. And uh, making an article free to read can help with additional citations. Uh, but still, they can charge the university for access. And then here we have just closed articles that are total access at a publisher and were not found via any free method discussed. So as we've discussed a little bit before, Sci-Hub had the least coverage of these gold open access articles. Um, here it had less than 50% coverage. In fact, we saw that in, uh, I believe, 2015 or 2016, Sci-Hub stopped downloading any articles from PLOS, the publisher PLOS, or the publisher um, Pierre J, I believe. And I think it was under the reasoning that these are open access publishers that are probably reliable and we don't need to worry about preserving that content. So Sci-Hub didn't want to spend resources on it. Uh, so that really showed that they explicitly focus on what would be termed the piracy or providing access to articles that can't come from elsewhere. Um, an interesting thing here is that Sci-Hub has such high coverage of green open access articles. You don't see any less coverage of green articles than you do for closed articles, which I think is evidence that people may not be finding green articles, and therefore they still use Sci-Hub to retrieve them, and that creates high coverage in Sci-Hub. Uh, so yeah, one thing is that although some articles may exist in these repositories, um, users still likely use Sci-Hub to access them. So next we looked into the coverage of the University of Pennsylvania Libraries. Uh, so this is an analysis we added on later in the project, but we thought, you know, hey, it would be good to compare Sci-Hub's coverage to that of a major university. And we're here at Penn, let's talk to a librarian. So the librarians were very helpful and they um, assisted us. But a little bit about Penn where I work is that it was founded by open science pioneer Benjamin Franklin, which that was cool, in 1749. It has an endowment of 10 billion US dollars. So it's quite wealthy and it spends 1.29 million, not billion. Oh, no, no, sorry. Okay, this is right. $1.29 billion on research per year. So that's how much it, it, it funds research. So it has large needs for access to a lot of literature. Um, but the library spent 13.3 or 13.13 million on electronic resources in 2017. And we got the statistics for how the users actually used it. Uh, they downloaded 7.3 million articles and 860,000 ebook chapters. Now, this electronic resources category basically is composed of these two things. So you can do an average, and the average per download cost uh, for the libraries of Penn is a dollar and 61 cents. So every time someone downloads an article, they're not paying that, but it, it equates to that amount. Uh, so here, we uh, tried to use this Penn Tech system, which is Penn's automated system for uh, fetching articles. So it looks like this if you go on the internet, uh, but it actually has an API, an automated programming interface, so we could do it automatically for a large number of articles. Uh, and this is based on the Alma Library Resource Management System from Ex Libre, which I saw a pen in the audience, so maybe it's used here. But um, it was a nice system because it enabled this type of API access. Uh, but what we found was that it was only 88% accurate uh, uh, regarding whether Penn had access to articles. So if we manually looked whether uh, its access call was correct, it was wrong 12% of the time. And that may not sound terrible, but um, for certain categories, it was wrong a lot. So half of the articles Penn Text claim not to have access to, it actually did. So Penn even doesn't know what it's subscribing to, essentially, in this automated system, which I think is another reflection of how complex this market has become and how it's had trouble transitioning into the digital age. So how did Sci-Hub compare? 
We manually looked because of the issues with um, the automated pen access calls at 326 toll access articles. So articles that um, you know you have to where there's a paywall. And what we found is that Penn had access to 80% of those, uh, whereas Sci-Hub had access to 94%. So here we see um, that Sci-Hub is mo more complete than this major um, library. And this is a confusing plot to most people, but I don't think it has to be that confusing. So there's three methods that we're showing of how you could access literature. One is through Sci-Hub. One is through Penn's library, and the other is through using the OADOI, or now called on paywall resource, which tries to find um, essentially a green open access version of a paywalled article. Um, and so here are the numbers I showed you for Penn and Sci-Hub. Notice that the number for OADOI is very low, 15%. Uh, so while I do think these um, methods of trying to find green open access articles are very promising and are a good thing. The issue is that most articles don't actually have, that are uh, toll access, they don't have a freely available copy um, if you're excluding like academic social networks, which themselves are probably mostly copyright infringement. Um, but another interesting finding is if you combine Penn and Sci-Hub's coverage, you're getting to 95 or 97%. Uh, Obviously, people here probably know this, but no library has access to all the literature, even you know Harvard <laughs> or here at um, ETH. It's impossible. It's yeah. <laughs> so now I'd like to talk a little bit about SciHub's download logs. So these come from two places. One was a data release from. John Bohannon's collaboration with, with Alexandra with the logs from a six month period uh, from 2015 to 16. The second is more recently Sci-Hub tweeted all the download logs for 2017. And these include like a code for the IP address. You don't know exactly what IP address it is, but it's um, matched to the uh, GPS locations. It's a good point to say if you care about privacy and you don't want your information in Sci-Hub, say even if you're using it for legal purposes, like for open access articles, you should use privacy enhancing technology such as the Tor browser or a VPN. And this goes for really doing anything on the internet, but is especially pertinent here. Who knows exactly what Sci-Hub's interests are and what they'll do with user data. Uh, so one thing we looked at is uh, how the downloads per article um, changed based on whether the journal was toll or open access and uh, the citation average of the journal. So we see that Sci-Hub is used to download open access articles much more frequently, or sorry, toll access articles much more frequently than open access, so that's a black versus gray, or I mean orange, and we also see that uh, people download articles in the more cited journals. This is an average band. Now here what we're looking at is average Sci-Hub downloads per day based on these logs. And uh, this is for the months which we have available data. You can see in 2016 uh, it was about 150,000 downloads per day. Uh, this was back when Elsevier uh, won its suit or got its temporary injunction. And then now in 2017, um, most months had downloads around 500,000 articles per day. Um, so that's a lot of articles, but it's actually not, it's an underestimate because <laughs> so I have tweeted update to 2017 download stats. It turned out that all DOI starting with 10.116 slash J pattern were marked as erroneous and were filtered out by exporter script. Then they released this list of these downloads. So I looked at them, and on average, uh, these 2017 estimates are missing 120,000 downloads per day. So probably most people can guess which um, publisher starts with this DOI. <laughs> it's Elsevier, the, the largest one. Uh, so these numbers are actually even higher. 
So we haven't talked yet about how Sci-Hub is funded. Uh, you don't have to you know, pay it to use it, it's free. Uh, but it does advertise Bitcoin addresses to which you can donate. In the past, it also had like PayPal addresses and centralized payment processors, but uh, it no longer has these as, um, that's an easy target for essentially uh, financial censorship. But Bitcoin, a distributed network, you know, can't be censored and Sci-Hub can control the private keys to these addresses, meaning it doesn't rely on any type of bank and anyone can donate. Um, what we see here is it's Sci-Hub is receiving over 30 donations per month uh, because the, the Bitcoin blockchain is called, the ledger of all transactions is public. Uh, so since we know these three addresses, we can see uh, the incoming transactions. And if we tabulate things, it's received in total up to 2018, uh, 1,200 donations totaling 94 Bitcoins. And I'm very sorry that my computer doesn't have the Unicode font point for the new Bitcoin symbol, which was released in Unicode 10.0 earlier this year, but hopefully it will soon. And <laughs> at the time of donation, if you converted this to US dollars, uh, it would be uh, 94 Bitcoins. Uh, sorry, these 94 Bitcoins, when they were donated, were worth like $70,000. Uh, but at the time that Sci-Hub withdrew them, because of the price appreciation of Bitcoin, they, they were worth 420,000 US dollars, and they still have some remaining. Sci-Hub did tweet, in all transparency, this information on donations is not very accurate, but I cannot correct it, that is confidential. And what we think are there, there's other methods uh, or addresses to which they could receive donations that we don't know about, so our audit only could include things that were publicly available. Now I'd like to get to, you know, why does this matter? Why did I come to Switzerland to come to a library to talk about this? And it's really been going on since at least 1990, um, which is called the Serials Crisis. And uh, this is the idea that it's extremely cost prohibitive to subscribe to all of these academic publications or in scholarly works. So, uh, from Dana Roth in 1990, the overall problem was seen by everyone concerned as a library problem. As such, the only solution to the library in 81 was to use monograph and binding funds to help offset the shortfall in serials and journals budget. Caltech's engineering libraries were extremely hard hit, and only now, after nearly seven years, have they recovered, just in time for the current crisis. So it wasn't good then, but as the crisis abated, um, We'll answer that soon, but I thought sort of funny at the end of this article about you know how bad it was, all these journal subscriptions, uh, the publisher had put in this advertisement where you're supposed to take this to your librarian and ask them to subscribe to this journal. So, uh, have things improved? So inflation from 1986 to 2015 has uh, been about 118 percent. Library expenditures have gone up 190 percent, so they've grown faster than inflation, which is good. Libraries have essentially larger budgets, but what we see is that the cost of journal subscriptions has grown by over 500 percent. So while libraries have bigger budgets, their budget is increasingly taken up with these subscriptions, leaving less for the other important things that libraries do. And a lot of them are having difficulty keeping float. So what's the solution? I think the solution is Libra open access, and I'm going to argue that it's actually an, starting to become an inevitability um, caused by Sci-Hub, and I'll explain why. So. Before really doing this project, I was interested in what we have here in Orange, which is you know the gold open access I discussed before, where articles are published under an open license, and you can legally reuse them. There are no permission barriers, or there are very minor permission barriers like attributing the work when you reuse it, um, because that, I think, is the best foundation for scholarship. Um, so I wasn't very interested in what we could call pirate open access or guerrilla open access here, represented by this symbol. Um, but what got me interested is I think the pirate open access is going to get us to this 
world of Libra open access. Uh, so when we posted our preprint, uh, the headlines certainly bought this point. They said in science, subscription journals are doomed, <laughs> data analysis suggests, or inside higher ed, inevitably open. And even, which I think is very extreme, a pirating service could bring down the whole establishment. <laughs> Um, one argument we hear is that librarians will never drop subscription access because they don't want to recommend illicit alternatives. And I think it is true. Most librarians are not going to tell their patrons to do something which could be illegal. Um, but I don't think they have to because there's a certain type of feedback loop where people start using Sci-Hub and that, first of all, decreases the usage of the library systems. So the library sees less downloads because people start using Sci-Hub for everything. And so it becomes harder to justify the expenditures that they're making because um, they're spending more each year on fewer and fewer downloads. And I'm not sure if this has begun to happen, but it could be a factor as we see a lot of people using Sci-Hub for access who do have university access. And the second, perhaps bigger factor is if the libraries cancel a subscription, they may not hear complaints. And in the past, that was really what you know kept them subscribing, is if they canceled it, the faculty would be upset. They would say, we need access to this to do our scholarship. But now, since awareness of Sci-Hub has grown so much, the faculty may find it easier to use that than to email the library with a complaint. And so there may be very little you know, feedback from the patrons um, insisting on retaining these subscriptions, or less and less. And actually, even Elsevier has come out and said this. Uh, so in 2013, the vice president wrote, what library will continue to subscribe if a growing proportion of articles is available for free elsewhere? And uh, more recently, the lawyers wrote, the project repository may be approaching a level of completeness where it can serve as a functionally equivalent replacement for Science Direct. So I think many publishers have seen the issue coming. There is a pretty clear solution, which is to switch to an open access model where um, you are paid for each publication and then you make it freely available afterwards. Um, but it is still profitable to do the subscription model and I think the journals will switch once it becomes unprofitable because people stop subscribing. Uh, and in a very ironic twist, even the subscription journals these days are advertising Sci-Hub. So uh, Nature, Ecology, and Evolution, there was a review article about 100 articles that every ecologist should read. Um, so these are 100 other articles it's recommending. And in the data availability statement, the, data, the only data is these 100 articles, they say the PDF files of the articles themselves should be available on Siam.io. So somehow this made it through the journal editing process. Which also underscores that you know, most journals don't do actually much that can't be automated. Um, in that most of the work is done by the academics who are providing the scholarship, the peer reviewers who do not get paid, editors who do not get paid, and um, the work that they do do a lot of people actually find counterproductive, like weird you know, typesetting guidelines and um, other frustrating aspects of their submission system. And a point which I think people here know, but everyone should realize is that you're not paid as an author when your article gets subscribed to or purchased. So it's not like other types of arts or creative things where copyright does have a very valid, valid purpose. Here, most of the stakeholders, in fact, almost every stakeholder, I would say, besides the publishers, want the articles to be open. The authors want to get their research out there. The funders want to get what they funded to be public knowledge. Uh, the readers obviously don't want to pay. So it's really only one stakeholder that, for historical reasons, has the ability to get ownership of the intellectual property and then act as the gatekeeper to the ideas contained within it. Because most, paper, or most studies really produce a paper, and while ideas are not copyrightable, the expression of them is. And therefore, while you know, the journal doesn't own the ideas, the only access to the ideas is through the paper, which the journal charges for. So are the times changing? Uh, I think there's some evidence, and if we start thinking since 2017, 
many European countries have pushed for read and publish deals where uh, they will be able to access an entire publisher's corpus of subscription content um, for a, a price, but they will also be able to publish all articles from their faculty in any journal by that publisher under an open license. So it's fantastic because the university gets to um, have access to everything for its researchers and it gets to make the research that it funds available to the world for free. And so I think this is a real way that uh, we could transition to a fully libre open access uh, literature. The publishers have not been happy and I believe you know there haven't been many successful deals like this but it seems like many big consortium are really steadfast in negotiating which is fantastic. Um, Sweden canceled Elsevier very recently uh, so they don't have access to new Elsevier articles. Um, negotiations with Elsevier are standstills in Germany, Peru and Taiwan I believe. Um, Montreal cut uh, over 93 percent of its Taylor and Francis subscription. Uh, the Netherlands has dropped Oxford University Press and there's a nice website called Sparks Cancellation Tracker. The URL is there and I just looked at it and 2018 is well populated with fresh cancellations on a large scale. And I would say there's acceleration. Another factor is preprint growth. Especially this is showing preprints in biological sciences. They are exploding right now. Um, everyone is becoming really interested in speeding up the publication process, allowing more feedback, uh, allowing papers to undergo peer review from the public before becoming in a static state. And obviously if something's available as a preprint, you don't even need a journal really. Um, and funders now have policies uh, such as the Gates Foundation saying that work we fund has to be published under a CC BY license. So my goal here is Libra Open Access, uh, which is really exciting for me because I do like text and data mining. Uh, so I would like to take all the knowledge in these papers and put them into a big corpus of uh, content that we can extract knowledge from on a massive scale. So another project I'll briefly talk about is called the Manubot, uh, which is a way for writing papers in the open um, in a very automated way that is free of charge. So this is a potential way that people could make articles without a journal. Um, and we actually wrote the paper for this Sci-Hub study using this Manubot. So it, it looks like this online and it comes in PDF and HTML. As you can see, it already looks nicer than a lot of journals, but it's completely automated and doesn't require um, you know, paying anyone. Um, so it, it's, uh, the tagline is powering the next generation of scholarly manuscript. So you can write in Markdown. So this is more for computational users who are familiar with Markdown and uh, Git, which is a version control system to track the history of the paper. Um, but I think the ideas could be implemented maybe in a more user-friendly way for a broader audience. But uh, you write a markdown, it automatically gets converted to this formatted text and the bibliography is automatically done. Uh, you cite by identifier. So rather than having to maintain all of the metadata for your studies, you say put in the DOI uh, or the archive ID or the PubMed ID or the URL and the software automatically re um, retrieves the metadata like the authors in the journal and then makes a bibliography. Uh, so we want to automate what has really been pain points in the past. And it uses something technical called continuous integration to whenever someone suggests a change to look if it's well formatted and then to deploy the change. It timestamps, uh, it, it deploys it back to GitHub so it updates on the website and it timestamps the manuscripts on the Bitcoin blockchain to, so you can prove that they existed at a past point in time, which could help with authorship or precedence disputes and makes it much harder to do certain types of fraud where you want to change what you said in your paper. Um, so it's an unprecedented level of verifiability. And not only that, we can have what are called pull requests, which just means someone can come and see the manuscript and suggest a change. It could be as small as fixing a typo or contributing a whole new section that uh, we should have missed. And so we want the future to be living but versioned. And uh, this was really helpful with this study. So 
Um, in the first version of our preprint, we said we estimate that over a six month period, SAI had provided access for 99.3% of valid incoming requests. This is wrong, but we didn't know that. And we found that out because SAI have tweeted in SAI have access logs released previous year, all requests are resolved requests. I usually successful, user successfully downloaded PDF with that DOI. And the way it was described in the article, it, uh, it made it seem like they were just all the requests rather than all the successful requests. So we had to change this finding, uh, but since we could make versions, we could just say in the first version of the study, we mistakenly treated the log events as requests. And this is the beauty of having a living literature, I think, because we all make mistakes. To be a good scientist or scholar, you have to make mistakes. <laughs> and uh, we want a system that supports fixing your mistakes. And right now with the journals, it's very hard to fix a mistake and it even has a negative connotation where the, if you have to either retract or make um, uh, some sort of addendum or something. So one final project we did here was a deep review, which was just a review article we wrote. And uh, we just invited really anyone to come contribute and 27 authors from 20 different institutions came and contributed paragraphs to this review article on deep learning. Uh, so it can scale collaborative writing to a high degree. But again, it's kind of technical. Um, so unless you know Git, I wouldn't use it now. But hopefully we can make some ideas that catch on. So finally, I want, well, I don't think we have questions next. I think we have um, another <laughs> talk or some slides and um, then uh, uh, some questions at the end but one final thing is uh, yesterday in Geneva uh, I presented them with this gift um, which looks like that it's like a piece of paper with this newspaper clipping on it and so I will read to you what I wrote <laughs> um, to the people of Switzerland thank you for inviting me to come share my research on SciHub and discuss the future of scholarly publishing I hope for a future where research is performed and published openly. Thanks to everyone here is also working hard towards this end. As a token of my gratitude, I present this commemorative clipping from the July 27th, 2017 edition of the Washington Times. Please enjoy this legal advertisement for which the American Chemical Society paid $305.55 to run as ordered by the judge in their uncontested suit against Sci-Hub as if Alexandra Albakian, who's based in Russia, would read a print U.S. newspaper. Perhaps one day academic societies and publishers will focus on spreading knowledge rather than suppressing it. Let's make this happen. So. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, uh, I think uh, <coughs> I'm not a talker here. I have only a few remarks uh, to the problem of SciHub, and my, my remarks uh, 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 will done from the perspective of a librarian and from a perspective of, uh, of institution, and also from a perspective, as I'm so sorry, Daniel, from an old man, and <laughs> obviously from a old-fashioned man that everything what I've learned in my life and was important for my life I've learned in kindergarten and in kindergarten it was said do not take things which do not belong to you and which owner you are not so uh, this is perhaps a point which we can discuss on sci um, perhaps uh, this is one of the crucial points we actually discuss from the legal aspect of sci -Hub, and uh, it is also an overall problem or, or topic on the very important question you have to give to us, who will pay for all the scientific publication at the end? And this is one of the crucial points a lot of people um, do not uh, look for in the discussion of actually we have done. Ladies and gentlemen, a few remarks. Uh, I have only few, three slides, uh, and a few remarks here on my notice block. Um, I think it is very important to see that SciHub covers a lot of things, and SciHub covers things more than the publishers has on their databases and more than the libraries 
a cover on their databases. And this is, on the one hand, the first point, it is a, a proof of mistrust uh, of libraries, one could say. If libraries are not able to cover things which are necessary for science and uh, for teaching, uh, there is something wrong. And on the other hand, if we pay a lot of money for things on the servers and uh, platforms of the publishers uh, we cannot access uh, to, it is also uh, Sci-Hub uh, which works as a proof of uh, mistrust uh, of publishers. So these two points I will uh, to, uh, point out in the next uh, few minutes on um, the first time. Oops, shift, enter. Oh, here, this is a presenter. Ah, oh, this one. Okay, perfect. Mm -hmm. SciHub has uh, proof of mistrust of libraries. This is, uh, dear colleagues, a little uh, a big problem. Um, you have a, a lot of possibilities as a scientist to direct go to SciHub, find the DOI, whatever you want, uh, and you don't have to access a library which offers you obviously a part of this, paid a lot of this, and make it very complicated to get through. And this is, uh, for me, uh, it, it hurts me very deep, and this makes me, yes, indeed, in my heart, uh, when I see this, our scientists, uh, and I'm sure, and I know that also scientists from the ETH, uh, from this famous university, also uh, have access to SciHub, as they are, it, it's much more better than the library. I know you pay a lot of things, a lot of money, but it's very easy to go. Uh, have the DOI and I have direct access to the paper which I need. Uh, even I do not uh, need to, to access SciHub, I go to Google and find it via Google to SciHub. And uh, if, you, if I uh, enter your library website, it is hardly complicated, uh, identification process, digital management process, and what else. And so this is a thing which um, makes me not sleep uh, during the night. Um, and this is one of the problem we have to solve, uh, and this is a, a competitor, SciHub, uh, for these uh, uh, things, and I think here it is necessary uh, to, to look at. These, these arguments are here on, 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 the, on the slides. Uh, no need for credentials or authentication, no needs to be within the IP range. Very, very comfortable to access all the things you need. Uh, also, this, um, uh, you, you do not need to switch the platform for different papers. Uh, how many million uh, articles are in SciHub? I forget. 60, 60, 60 million. 69 million? 60 million. Si 60 million, 60 million articles. Uh, it doesn't matter which discipline you have access, wherever you are, sitting on the Zurich, uh, Lake Zurich, sitting far in the back uh, of Australia, no problem. If you have internet, you have SciHub. And even it doesn't matter where SciHub actually is, if it is in the USSR, in China, uh, on the moon, or where else the server stands, nobody knows it actually, you have access. And this is indeed a very uh, big problem for us because we work hard on our infrastructure in the libraries, uh, but we uh, cannot satisfy, obviously, the scientists uh, who need uh, a very quick, fast, um, barrier-free access to all what they want. Uh, so I think, I feel uh, SciHub is a mistrust, uh, is a proof of mistrust of libraries, so libraries have to think about what can we learn from SciHub. This is a real problem which we have to think about. SciHub is easy uh, everywhere, uh, no discipline, no specific systematic uh, complications, and so I think we have to think from this uh, aspect to SciHub. And the second uh, uh, slide is a proof of mistrust of publishers. Of course, we all know also as librarians, and especially as librarians, because it was a librarian's uh, impact, or it was a start from the librarians to, to discuss on the journal crisis. It is uh, not an invention of scientists. It is the first time that librarians told it is hard to to cover all the costs. We do not have enough money for all the, 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 the journals to, to license and buy. And so the journal crisis started. And the, uh, now a, a heavy part of the driver of the open access movement are librarians and not only scientists. So I think uh, also the librarians uh, were very uh, hard on the front uh, to think on new ideas of uh, publications and what we can learn from it. So uh, a proof of mistrust of publishers, of course, because uh, uh, we need alternatives to the monopoly or the olig oligopoly situation in the publishing market, the big five or the big three. Uh, 
take everything what we have. Uh, this is a big problem, actually. We spend a lot of money uh, for it. The profit margin is very high. So Sci-Hub uh, uses um, uh, free in a, in a specific way themselves from the big five publishers. They take uh, their information they need from Sci-Hub uh, and, uh, and hope to spur publishing industry to adapt new business models. So I completely agree with you, uh, David, uh, Daniel, uh, that um, there is a big dysfunctionality in the publishing system, actually, we have. Uh, but I think uh, Sci-Hub is a symptom of this, and it's not the solution. And this is what we can discuss, I think, uh, or we have to discuss, because uh, th there are a lot of uh, implications from the institutional side we have to, to think about. Uh, and I take my last slide. The great potential in exploring search via discovery tools compared to the uh, known item search usually by DOI. So there are assets for libraries w uh, which Sci-Hub does not uh, have library as a honest broker. You know it is funny and you uh, are always smiling, talking uh, us where Sci-Hub actually has his server, but nobody knows uh, if uh, uh, the young lady tomorrow will be bought out by Elsevier, uh, Sci-Hub will be crashed. It's always a question of price, and uh, we know this. So I think uh, libraries can work here in a time where fake news uh, are a part of our reality as a honest broker. They can guarantee persistent access, archiving. This is also not what... Uh, um, uh, Sci-Hub uh, will l solve for us. This is a big issue for libraries in the future. Uh, and uh, they have, of course, a lot of different media types which are not available in Sci-Hub. Uh, and of course, we discuss here on information and literature which is uh, used and published in SCM segment especially. This is have very fine covered by Sci-Hub. It is stolen by the publishers. It is uh, uh, put in the Sci-Hub server. Uh, but, uh, the rest of the information uh, for a whole uh, scientific perspective. I'm talking on uh, human, uh, I, I'm talking on, on arts and humanities. I'm talking on gray literature, which is published by small, um, by small uh, universities or small uh, publishers, uh, a lot of analogous material, which is not available in Sci-Hub. This is a whole range of information uh, uh, coverage uh, is made by libraries, not by every, by each library by itself, but by the whole network of the library which works together and we uh, can collaborate, of course, in this way. So I think this is very important uh, at the end to see uh, Sci-Hub is a symptom for a dysfunctionality in our publication process, but on the other hand, uh, it is, of course, and this is now the institutional aspects uh, I as a librarian can bring into the discussion, it is illegal. It is illegal and uh, the, the content is stolen by Sci-Hub from the publishers. And this is a fact we cannot uh, ignore. This is a fact we have to discuss. Even if we do not believe in the high prices and even if we think this is not a moralic price which is actually um, covered or which, which actually we have to pay on the market, but we live in a democratic system and a democratic system it is not allowed to, to steal things and uh, at this background a library cannot uh, uh, recommend their users to use Sci-Hub because we do not have money for buying information, literature and, and, and elsewhere. I am paid to organize a professional information management in my university, not by doing illegal tricks, but by working hard on the market, uh, negotiating, um, uh, discussing, um, finding new ideas, innovate with document delivery, uh, things, think about new possibilities and chances for publishing uh, process, uh, supporting open access activities wherever it is possible, but on the, uh, in the range of the legal system of Switzerland. And uh, so I think uh, this is a big problem. On the one hand, you as a user, as a scientist, can say, okay, very easy to go to, to, um, to um, Sci-Hub and, and access my article. But me as a librarian uh, and a representative of institution, uh, it's not allowed to do it. Uh, and uh, on, the, on the other hand, every uh, uh, country has its own legal situation. 
Here in Switzerland, for example, it is a wonderful situation for you as a user. Uh, it is legal for you to use illegal material. Uh, this is very interesting, and I think it is a good solution here in Switzerland, because uh, um, we, we thought that it, it is complicated for you to find out uh, if the source you use is legal or not illegal. Uh, in Switzerland, we look on the source by itself, and we find, would like to find out if the source is illegal, we will go to punish to this illegal resource uh, provider, but not to the user uh, who actually is not able to oversee the millions and millions uh, um, things in the internet and to discuss and to decide illegal, not illegal, illegal, not illegal. But this is only the situation in Switzerland. Uh, in the European countries, that is completely different. You could be punished if you, as a scientist, go to SciHub, use your article, this is illegal in Germany or in France or in the Netherlands. It is not illegal in Switzerland. But um, you see, uh, this is one of the problems we have as an institution with SciHub on the, on the one hand. So uh, I, I think this is uh, uh, important to... To, um, to, to discuss these three aspects, in my opinion, and I will already in a, a, a few seconds. Uh, on the one hand, uh, um, proof of mistrust of libraries. What can libraries do better for the users? A mistrust, um, um, a proof of mistrust of um, publishers. What can do they better? What we have to discuss with the publishers? why we have the situation, and the uh, third is uh, the legal aspects we have to discuss and take in our, into account if we use, not use, discuss on SciHub on the other hand. So, and this is my last slide. Uh, uh, as you can see, the biggest science, science hub is in Switzerland in Zurich, and so I'm very interested and keen on the discussion. Thank you. So I, thanks for your perspectives. I found them really enlightening and interesting. I definitely sense that you know, you're discontent that you are spending a lot and providing these resources, which people are then using an illicit <laughs> service instead of. But um, one point I'd like to mention is I think the role of the library is much bigger than just getting subscription access to literature. So we took a tour today. We saw the amazing old maps and manuscripts they have here. Um, from the 1500s, and we went to the Digitization Center. Uh, so I think these are very valuable uh, parts of the role of a library that uh, subscriptions actually detract from because there's a limited budget. And I would say in a world where we switch to all open access, which I think should be the goal, the library will still have a major role, such as helping the researchers um, do analyses across large amounts of literature, helping them find the literature that they need, archiving the literature, uh, those sorts of roles. So yes, while libraries are in the odd position of having spent a lot of money on something that may seem to be less and less necessary and therefore um, feel almost like a, a threat to their current model, I think it actually will be a benefit for them in the long term to have more of their mission um, going towards things that really directly benefit uh, their user base in society. Daniel, you're completely right. Uh, I completely agree, and perhaps 
if we look in the very far future, I can agree with you, as I say, perhaps the time is over when the business model of a library was to pay money for things which are behind the paywall. <laughs> this could be a very f uh, far away a future perspective for us, and we are not afraid uh, in our libraries that we have no uh, ideas, uh, innovations, uh, uh, works to do, uh, supporting uh, uh, research and teaching. But, but what, what, what my problem is, there is no such thing than a free lunch, and you know it. And in, in this discussion on, on, on SciHub and the publication process or the open access dis discussion, I'm always thinking about who will pay at the end for the publication mm -hmm. costs. And actually we go to the transition. You put it on your slides for the transition process, APCs, author article pays, uh, author article processing charges, not the library, subscribe, not have to pay, everything is free, but the author pays when he or she uh, publishes an article. This is the same uh, dependence on, on the big five uh, publishers, but only from the other side. So instead of the journal crisis, we will have the APC crisis in a few yeah. years. So uh, I think uh, the, we, we, all activists, all the activists here in SIAP, all activists of open access have to understand that to publish an article produces costs. You, you have to pay for this. And the quest, real question is, who will pay for this? If you do not publish an article, okay, this is wonderful. You can make research and science, but not communication. Yeah. This is free of cost, wonderful, we, we, we save a lot of money. But if you would like to communicate your information, this is what scholarly communication is, to communicate that what you find out, you communicate with your research community, uh, someone has to pay for this communication. And still now we have found a good solution with the publishers. In 300 years, uh, it is an outsourced system. We have a production of scale. Um, the, uh, the publishers produce these articles. They get some money for this. Uh, by uh, uh, selling these things uh, to the to the community back to the libraries or to individual uh, uh, individuals, but uh, it is clear if you produce an article in the analog time or in the digital time, there will be costs. Who will pay for it, Daniel? Yes, who will pay? <laughs> so um, maybe we we'll take up this question and, and see uh, if there are uh, any suggestions from the audience, because we want to hear if there are, there are things. Uh, that, that uh, add to, to what you have discussed and uh, what Bahibal has discussed. Um, let's see if there are some, some things to remark. Sh should I answer the who will pay first and then <laughs> we'll yeah, do maybe, I, maybe so a short, a short answer. Yeah. I, I think it's not actually a very big transition to switch to uh, an article processing open access model. And you're right, there may be an APC crisis. Right now, a lot of these charges are unreasonable and are too high, and I do think price some people out of the publication market. Um, but overall, it's a much less bad crisis than what we're uh, currently in. First of all, because the end result is open literature, which just has so many benefits. Another thing is the cost is much more transparent, and it's paid once up front. Uh, whereas now, the cost is paid you know, throughout the future, and it's very hard to know how much a journal is actually getting for each article, and it, you never actually have to stop paying until the work finishes copyright, which is essentially never <laughs> under today's <laughs> laws. Um, and there have been some studies looking at the average cost paid for an open access article and the average cost paid for a subscription article, and I think subscription articles, you know, on average have a hidden cost of about $5,000, Per article and open access articles are closer to one or two thousand dollars. Now that's still way too high in my opinion, but I think it's a step in the right direction. So I, I totally agree that um, it's not over the problems, um, and also libraries will have a role in uh, negotiating deals with publishers for, say, all their faculty to be able to publish in journals um, openly, and it'll be great to see how it evolves. Thank you. So let's see if there are some remarks or questions from the audience. <laughs> okay. Yeah, one, one more question. Of course, yeah, there must be a question. Yeah. Just to add on, on what you just explained, there's another aspect of uh, this. It's not only a question what is the total cost of, of having this content in, in comparison between a subscription model and, and the read and publish uh, model, but also that with the 
this next generation of, of big deals we're preparing <coughs> in, the, in the recent published model, we are again concentrating on these big five. And, and they, so of course, this is the huge amount of money which, uh, which uh, is flowing away from the science system to the, to the publishers. So it's politically legitimate to, to concentrate on that. But on the other hand, um, I'm afraid that we have again this, this um, fostering the monopolization or oligopolization of the mm -hmm. publishing market in concentrating on these, on these uh, global publishers again. So that's something which, um, and, and of course we have a bias on, on STM publishers again. So, the, so for the whole, for the, um, regarding the whole science publication system, it's somewhat one-sided what, what's happening at, Yeah, it's a, it's a great remark. Um, there is, for people who don't know, this increasing <laughs> there's an increasing oligopoly of scientific publishers where there used to be more and a lot of them has merged. There's now fewer and fewer. And I'm not sure that's really gonna go away, although I would like this to be as you know decentralized as possible. I think one way we can move away with, from this is to adopt preprints more heavily because um, essentially when you're posting preprints, the role of the preprint server is quite minimal. It's really just posting it, uh, hosting it, and allowing a place for people to comment. Um, so hopefully we can diminish the large role that journals play to make uh, essentially these monopolies or oligopolies a little bit less dangerous. Delia, what do you think on, on, on branding? A scientist who will make a career needs mm. brand. Five papers in Nature, uh, five in the Lancet, what else? And if there is only a wonderful preprint server, which is very low cost uh, and is very fast in, uh, in the publication process, where do you, how can you uh, tell uh, your uh, bosses that y your career is a good one yes. if you do not have five in Nature papers? I would love that future because it means people would actually have to evaluate your research <laughs> rather than just looking at the journal name. But it also harps on the point, which is a true point, that journals do provide a useful form of branding and selection of a lot of literature. But where I think a more open model shines is that uh, currently with the system, you have peer reviews which are done in private. Um, by usually anonymous reviewers who have no incentive to provide good reviews and they're never published with the paper and the papers don't really have much post-publication discussion. So while um, you do have this initial peer review check, we're not capturing all the thought and all the review that's been done in, on a paper in a public way. And so if we could move things to a post-publication system where anyone who was interested could provide meaningful peer review on a paper, uh, potentially we could be capturing a lot more feedback. And through that feedback, we could develop metrics and the ability for you to sort of outsource uh, whether you trust a paper to other experts, which is really what peer review attempts to do. And potentially we could do it in a much better way because you would see what the other expert said, and you could have discussion and conversation and consensus. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you very much. And I suppose one of the aspects is that that uh, traditional publications, the, the reputation of traditional publications, is still higher than open access publications. But that's a development that uh, that will change within the next years and. and we have to, to, to look at, at this developer because this is nothing that has to do with the economics of publications but with the scientific culture that is behind it because I think scientists want to publish open, in, in open access journals and try to push this part of, of the publication possibilities that it will change and uh, the, the importance of the traditional journals will uh, gradually uh, diminish uh, over time. We have to, to wait what happens. De definitely. And uh, a few points on that. There are prestigious open access journals, um, depending on your field. Uh, also, if every scientist were to start submitting their most prestigious and best work to you know the open journals, this situation would change overnight. 
Now, obviously, it's hard to be the one that goes first because it's a little bit of a leap of faith or a little bit of risk. But uh, we should be the change we want to see in science. And if we feel strongly about it, um, I think now many people really respect if you say, I you know, only publish in open access journals, I only review for open access journals, um, and you start supporting ethical publication. And I think people will appreciate it enough and that you'll get your word out there by being more open. And while it's more of an uncharted path, I think your career will go well. Just maybe one personal question relating to this. Your own paper was published open access. It's some kind of role model in open accessibility because you have published the data. It's, it's uh, uh, can, you can see it on GitHub. The text is, uh, is published in open access. The, the persons involved in writing the uh, text are uh, uh, get their, their are named, and, and you, you know who has written parts of, of your text. Have you got any feedback from from uh, people who have, who have read your article? Yeah. That so that this is something new, and that they support your your uh, your own. Um, There's been a lot of feedback. A lot of people liked it. A lot of questions on the GitHub or via Twitter. Um, actually, we received a lot of the feedback when we posted the preprint, mm -hmm. and that's when all the news articles were written on it. Yeah. So honestly, we didn't even need to publish. <laughs> the paper to yeah. for most of the impact. Really what publishing the paper did, I guess, is look good on our CVs, which is the problem that I was alluding to. And I, I guess in a way, you know, even I am part of the problem by, by having pursued this to the peer reviewed stage when it, perhaps that wasn't necessary. <laughs> but um, well, yeah, it's- It shows it's, that the system works. You can write, uh, you can publish, uh, um, First versions of your text, and you can uh, yeah. collect feedback. And uh, so, so there could be some. I mean, there could be some really interesting twists, which didn't happen, um, and I don't think would happen that often. But would really um, be totally unprecedented, probably for science. To so say we were halfway through our study, and another group thought that we were we had taken the wrong turn, we were not yeah. doing it right. They could essentially fork our study, and they could take it in their own so direction, yeah. and. Yeah. Um, I think that would actually be kind of cool, and I don't think many people would want to do that because we're already doing the study, so it's not a good use of time. But it's cool from the level of if someone has gotten up to a certain point with a project but now is not a good steward of it or is not taking the right direction, uh, so other people can pick it up. We don't have uh, all this effort being wasted and redone constantly, which I think will allow progress to accelerate. This is a very important aspect, Daniel. But, but uh, I have a question on, on piracy on your own text and on your own material. What about copyright issues? Do you not afraid if you publish everything very open that one came, someone came and said, okay, we are living in a sharing world. I yeah. take part of this uh, articles, copy and paste, and publish another article with your ideas. This that, is much more well, easier if everything is open. And it's yes, so the ideas are not copyrightable, so they could do that, they could take the ideas uh, regardless of whether the paper, my paper had an open license. But what I actually, I would love for someone to take my paper and quote it or use parts of it and attribute it, which is what the most common open license, a creative common attribution license requires, is that you have to, uh, you know, link to or reference the source. And in the age of the internet, it's actually great for me if someone quotes me because they provide a link. And then the search engines are based on links between papers. So uh, the more people that reuse my content and uh, link to it or cite it, uh, the more highly ranked my content will be, which will help me. Uh, as a scholar, I don't succeed when someone doesn't reuse my work. I succeed when people reuse my work and get the word out. A lot of my students reuse text material without linking, without quotation. <clears throat> so they, they could... Um, that is illegal and violates scientific norms, whether it has an open license or whether it's yes, subscription. It Those people who do that don't care whether it's an open access paper or not. In fact, they would probably prefer a closed access paper because it's more difficult to detect the plagiarism <laughs> via an automated method if it's closed access.
But if everyone, everyone appreciates it, it, it's wonderful. Like Sci-Hub, it, it's illegal, but everyone likes it. It's perfect, no? There's a big difference between legality, which is what copyright deals with, and what Sci-Hub is breaking, and scientific norms. Indeed. Scientific norms uh, say you should not plagiarize, that you should cite work. Um, and I think most academics or scholars have good attribution practices, not because of legality, but because of the norms. And so they're sort of separate issues. I, feel, I feel bad breaking illegal, uh, illegal or legal status of companies. I do not drive to the petrol station, took my petrol and drive away because I ah. think the prices are too high. So yes. uh, this is uh, another kind of, of, of moral status actually we have. Uh, and, and I think Sci-Hub uh, um, will, will in, in, in a few years there will not be Sci-Hub. We will have other solutions uh, on the publication market. But actually it is a thing uh, where a lot of people even using it, it will, will not allow if one take their own uh, backpack and say, oh, this is my backpack, it's nice, looks yeah. nice, I take it away. He will say, hey, it's my backpack. Say, so, okay, it's, it's yeah, if you go over there and take my backpack, <laughs> I won't be able to do my hike, <laughs> you know, that's coming up, it'll be very bad. But the difference with digital goods is that they can be duplicated, whereas my backpack can't be duplicated. So uh, that's one distinction, and ethically, you know, publication, it, 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 we're, we're not saying that all digital goods should essentially have no ownership, um, but it's a unique situation where almost all of the research has been publicly funded, where the authors want to get the ideas out there. Uh, so ethically, who's stealing what? Have the journals just found some legal tactic to essentially steal this great investment by society? It's, it's, it's a deep discussion we can do yeah. by wine, two hours, uh, <laughs> and even longer this, this, this night. So. There's no answer, okay. but Thank you very it's much to both of you. That's exactly the point it is. I think we have to stop here because the timing is over. And, uh, but I thank you very much. We see there is a lively discussion going on, and it will go on f uh, further. Uh, we can't uh, find the solution today, but uh, we will discuss uh, the, the topic uh, in other uh, situations. Again. So thank you very much for coming to both of you and thanks for coming to you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.